Hey guys, welcome to another episode of Arcane Assist. We're excited today to present a, a cool matchup. Uh, we, we promised we'd be playing some more Grimkin. So Evan has taken the helm of the Grimkin, and we'll be playing with his favorite caster in the faction, the Heretic. Yeah, the guy is super cool, and he has a lot of ways to be played, including, as you might be surprised, with guns! Yeah, uh, Grim can actually have some pretty respectable guns, usually in their infantry tools, and uh, we are showcasing the other theme force, the Bump in the Night theme force for them today. Uh, I'm playing against Evan, and I am playing some Lich Lord Asphyxius, one of my favorite casters in Mark II. I played a ton of Asphyxius. He got um, a pretty significant rework for Mark III, which they then went back to and made some changes on. Uh, I think he's got a lot of really cool tools, several things that focus on powerful soul collection, and because I feel like he really likes recurring banes, I am playing him in the Dark Host. Seems reasonable. So Dark Host theme force. I'll go through my list really quickly with you here. I'm playing Lich Lord Asphyxius, and I brought with him a Scarlock Thrall. Uh, I'm also playing Kanker Worm, two Death Rippers, and a Rip Jaw. So this is a battle group with which I'm trying to play with a bunch of different things. Um, I want to kind of use them as a caster who can sort of go out and laser things really effectively. So I brought the Scarlock Thrall, so I can have an extra source of Excarnate. Um, to satisfy the requirement of bringing either the battle engines or a whole bunch of banes, I brought both. Uh, I have a Wraith engine, and I also have uh, Derek Wraith, who is uh, not does not count toward free points, but he does extend the threat range of your army quite considerably. Uh, I also have Bane Lord Tartarus, who I got for free in the theme. I have a max unit of Bane Knights and two max units of Bane Warriors, mm -hmm. both of whom get the Officer and Standard, and both of those Officer and Standards are free in this theme force. Uh, because I'm playing Dark Host, I have the option to put down two 4-inch clouds up to 20 inches up on the board. Um, because Evan's staring across the board at me with an army that contains two max units of Isla Sight military rifle models. I decided the clouds would be more in my way than they really were in his and opted not to place them. It's fair. Uh, so in the Grimkin list, we have the Heretic with two Cage Raiders, Skin and Moans, and the Gorehound. The battle group is actually super, uh, super good for the Heretic. Now, you don't start with the corpses like you do in the other theme list, so you don't get to be arc nodes right off the bat. Uh, the skin and moans doesn't get to hit us hard right off the bat. But uh, the animi that it provides for you are super useful. So, for example, with the skin and moans and the gorehound, you have access to Pathfinder on the heretic. Uh, so he can go over things like walls when charging. And he is a caster that does want to go in and hit stuff himself sometimes because he has a just a crazy melee presence with guided, so his weapons automatically hit. Dispel, so you can just strip up keeps from things. Yep. And Fury on himself is not a bad idea most of the time. He goes to what, past rank 16 or something 16. crazy? Yeah. yeah. That's a lot. I mean, even even Harbinger got a lot of work done with auto-hitting POW 12s, but he has auto-hitting POW 13s. He has a uh, 2-inch melee on them as well. 2-inch melee. Yeah, 2-inch melee. And then he has access to Fury to really ramp that up to, uh, in this case, 16. Yeah. And not to mention the fact that if, say, something runs to engage your caster, you can cast Lurker and then beat it to death and then walk away and then cast Lightning Strike from the Gorehound and then walk away even further. Because <laughs> uh, the Gorehound has Sprint, so he can even get in there and get out pretty easily. Yeah, and Sprint does not need to be on you before you kill the model, so you can actually yep. you know, have, it, have seen the time where you kill the thing before you bushwhacked. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, so it's theoretically as much as a 12-inch redeploy, although it's a bit narrow. Um, what else is in the list, Evan? So we got the battle engine, the death knell, super useful. You basically always want this, and you bring enough bodies for yourself anyway, because the rest of the list is two full units of hollow men with the lantern mans uh, and a unit of dread rots. Uh, my free points in this list are only a witch wood and a lantern man, um, but lantern men are super useful, uh, less so against cricks, but the concealment's always nice, and uh, when you can, bloodbound is pretty great. Um, and all these dread, rot dread rots are fantastic, which would, despite not being able to use its gun on most things in the Grim or the Crix list, is still a teleporting two-inch reach POW 15 tree monster. It's pretty good. Yep. The tree monster. So I think uh, without further ado, we're going to jump right into the video here. So uh, I won the roll. 
and we'll be going first with Dark Host. Uh, the train set that we're playing with here was actually very, very generously constructed and donated to our local store, Black Knight Games, by uh, Ian. Uh, Ian is an ex-press ganger, regularly awesome dude, runs a lot of events for the community, volunteered a ton at the Southern Ontario Open, um, really sweet guy. And he just decided that he wanted to have a little bit more kind of really playable terrain that was well-sized for War Machine available at the store. So he constructed this uh, this kind of a train set, uh, which I thought was really neat. Um, got a couple of pieces there that we're playing as obstructions. The tracks themselves in this matchup are playing as trenches inside the actual template of the tracks. And they've got a couple of kind of stacks of rail car looking walls. Uh, and our objectives are themed in the train set as well. So it actually kind of makes a really aesthetically pleasing table set. Yeah, it's pretty awesome. Uh, we're using the uh, railways as trenches because mm -hmm. they're basically the same size as a trench template. We've got a lot of instructions and a lot of linear obstacles, as well as the piece in the middle, which we're just using as a, an obstacle you can see over. Yeah, because um, the it's a little bit difficult to see from this angle, but the slats in that water tower are actually like super porous, so we're, we've just assigned it a height value at fairly, fairly low to where it is, so Evan's guns will be able to see my banes through it, no problem, and in turn my banes will be able to see through it and charge through it, because most of the things in this list have ghostly. So it seems like a typical Dark Host turn, just running up, screaming, mm -hmm. going yep. as fast as you can. All the things ran up super far. Uh, some of the things ran up slightly further than other things because of Derek Wraith giving them an extra inch of movement. Nice. Uh, Asphyxius, for his part, will walk up some and teleport some more. Fair enough. I guess I could have run. <laughs> <laughs> I did not. Yeah, I guess he doesn't really have anything you want to cast turn one, huh? Uh, some people would cast uh, Hellbound, which would deny people from charging me, but it's not an upkeep anymore. It's just a thing you recast every turn. Fair enough. Uh, alternately, I could lay down a nice line of cloud walls, which would be very effective against your eyeless sight shooting. Yes. So I don't do any of that. <laughs> <laughs> for obvious reasons. Uh, so the Holloman line apparates up. Uh, I feel like it's worth mentioning all of these models were painted well, almost all of them. I painted the Heretic, and it was kind of a group effort on a lot of the Dread Rots and stuff. But most of this army has been painting, painted by our good friend Brad at Bold Design Painting. Um, so, yeah, shout out to him. Yeah, no, Brad's actually done some really amazing work. Uh, he just finished a ton of um, new models, finished up uh, Dreamer, which is who's my favorite. I've gushed about her on the Moose Machine cast before, so I'd, I won't give you all of that again. But... Um, yeah, he's, uh, he's done a great job painting this stuff. Um, really, like, striking contrast, good color choices. Uh, he's a big fan of, um, I can't remember the, the source material, but there's, like, an adaptation of Alice in Wonderland that is a lot of kind of... Yeah. It, um, it more strongly emphasizes the kind of grim and surreal themes in the, uh, the work than some other um, artists' depictions of it. And he's taken that as pretty significant inspiration for this... Uh, Grimkin Army scheme, and uh, I've just been going to town with it, and I really love it. So, um, in terms of my actual turn, I'm running up the right-hand side with some Holloman, or I suppose from this angle, it's the top side of the table, um, with mm -hmm. the red unit of Holloman. The Kadoran Holloman? Yep, the Kadoran Holloman. With There's all actually, the... yeah, a bunch of the <laughs> SmogCon exclusive model. I don't know if you can see there, he's the, the guy with the, the little hat and the crow. Yeah. Looks pretty sweet. Just um, replaces a grunt in the unit, so I just got a whole yeah. bunch. So they've kind of lined up against the Banes in the top zone, staying just out of their range. But we're totally in range of the Arc Node and the uh, Canker Worm. And we move the Cage Rager up as much as he can't get corpses, or not corpses, he's not an Arc Node yet. But he, hopefully with the amount of infantry on the table, he will be soon. Uh, Skin and Moans is just going to move up. I'm kind of squaring him up against the Wraith engine just because I have Wraith Bane um, as a possibility to go out and get it. Yep. Yeah, a lot of access to, you know, anti-incorporeal tech in this list. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate it. Not to mention, like, the Heretic himself just has Hex Blast and Gallows if he wants to. Uh, so Dread Rot moving up, basically getting ready to go whichever way they need to. Death Knell moves up to just gather all the corpses it possibly can. Yep. The Heretic scoots up the middle, uh, puts Fury on himself. 
because I expect the Wraith engine to come up, and at the moment the only thing that can kill it is um, the Heretic, unless the Skin and Moans is able to walk over that wall and get incorporeal and be happy. Um, but I, I kind of expect it co to come up this turn. Uh, he also places out the Wall of Fire template, just to make mm -hmm. it a lot harder for those Bane Knights to get through and further up um, the table on Tim's second turn. Yeah, that is basically the corridor that they want to be running through, and instead they don't get to, which is kind of a problem. So it's kind of jamming me up a little bit. It, it is wor worth pointing out that little sort of nuanced interaction that Evan's describing. Um, normally, skin and moans hang out behind walls quite happily, bumping themselves up to defense 17 or 15 melee even, and just don't care. Um, but uh, in, in this case, he kind of does care because if he has Wraith being cast on him by someone else and he tries to lurker himself to get over the wall, he actually loses the Wraith Bane animus. Yeah. So it's, so, uh, it's a bit tricky. Uh, I feel like it's worth noting, what I'm doing with this Gorehound is thinking he has Boundling Leap, which he doesn't. He's because not a Because he's not a Crabbit or, or a Crabbit. Because um, I was like, wait, I could have sworn there was a way I could get through this obstruction in front of me. He has Ghostly. That was the rule yep. that I that I forgot he had. Uh, he was right through that obstruction. Not Boundling Leap. So he's there now yep. where he was supposed to be, and I didn't make a mistake. New stuff, new faction, <laughs> lots of little elements. We caught it before we uh, sent the video out, so that's uh, step one. Nailed it. And he's actually kind of terrifying against those main knights because he has pull. He does. Yeah, so he can pull them out of Wall of Steel, reduce their armor, just kind of be mean to them. Um, he's also fast enough that he can usually walk into threat range of them and not deal with their set defense problem. Mm-hmm. So uh, they're going to run, and they're going to run around the Wall of Fire so I don't just lose a bunch of Bane Knights for nothing and turn into some little tiny Bane Knight triangles of Wall of Steel and set defenseness. Yeah, I'm not sure they got enough credit for that in the CID. Yeah, I definitely was uh, was a Bane Knight hater uh, before putting them on the table. It's interesting. Th so one of the big things that the Community Integrated Development process emphasizes is don't bother giving us any feedback unless you've got games tested. And I give a lot of feedback, but I only ever did it with models that I put on the table, and Bane Knights never really excited me enough to put them on the table. But uh, post-CID, with their rules being live and a lot of people talking about how great they are, I've been putting them on the table. And while getting them there doesn't do a ton, they do just deliver themselves really, really effectively. So, I don't know. I like them. They're, they've been doing good things for me. Yeah. We're about to have a cool asphyxious turn. Every asphyxious turn is a cool asphyxious turn. I, what, what was that? I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. I, I said every asphyxious turn is a cool asphyxious turn. Ah. ah. Yeah. But we're about to have a cool <laughs> asphyxious turn. So, asphyxious walks up, swings Demortis around, and hucks it over there, tosses it on top of a couple of those folks. Uh, he's going to cast an Excarnate at a tree, boost some damage, and blow up a tree. Because... Tree does not like that. Yeah, I didn't really want the tree to be around. And I can hit it, so I'm going to kill it. Clearly. So it is toast. Yeah, Asphyxius can just, just be a Gatling gun sometimes. Just goes out there and isn't afraid. Um, he's going to cast... I believe it's Hellbound he's casting. It is. It's Hellbound. So it makes the area within five inches of him rough terrain, and it also makes it so the models can't charge him, which is pretty cool. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, that's that's decent. Um, I, I don't think he's, like, super a threat of being charged by stuff right now, but I'm behind a wall, which is important. Uh, Cankerworm charges up, and Cankerworm uses its, its smaller attack to attack its charged target and kills the charged target. Um, because he's in the uh, AoE that Asphyxius threw out, um, Asphyxius collects the soul, regardless of proximity. So I getting... trump Arcana after you kill my guy. Yeah, so Arcana often can be a source of surprise. Asphyxius has two souls, and Canker Room is now going to reposition five, which is its bond. So I'm thinking to myself, okay, you applied a trump Arcana. Good job. All you did is make it slightly easier for you to damage Cankerworm, who you're never going to get to damage because Cankerworm has stealth, and I'm going to jam with a whole bunch of Banes. And then you're like, these rifles aren't going to charge him. They have Isla Sight and military rifles. They're just going to stand here and shoot him. 
And I was like, hmm. Yeah. So, actually, I feel like this is a good point to mention. My arcana are Reckoning, which is the Trump arcana, which I must take, Mm -hmm. Pandemonium, and Labyrinth. Yes. Uh, The same two alternate that we took in the first battle report, they're very good arcana against armies that have speed five as well as armies that rely on a lot of orders. Yep. Um, And those are typically lots of banes and er, and, uh, lists with lots of units. Because, well, Banes and Errants, for that matter. Exemplars. Because Exemplars are also Speed 5 Weapon Masters that are mean. So those are what what's going to happen. Uh, Reckoning, since we haven't explained that one before, is essentially, uh, when you kill a model in my control area, I can pop it, I get prey against that mar- uh, model for my entire army, and when I kill that model, I can move it to a different unit, or a different model and just keep on going <laughs> with my entire army. Yeah, so it, it has the potential to be really powerful, but just like Prey, if you can find a way to effectively deny it, it can be really good. So what I thought I'd done is pulled Kankaroom back out of range that would be likely to not ignore my stealth and then screened with a bunch of models. And then Evan reminds me that obviously this unit has Isla Sight, and I'm like, okay, that's fair, but I'm still 1416. I've got a huge grid. The odds of you actually killing Kankaroom are fairly slim, right? Uh, what are they, Rat 5? And everyone yep. points out that they're Rat 5, but now they can aim because they apparated carefully mm-hmm. into range. And they also get plus 2 from the Arcana, so they're actually Rat 9. Yep. Which means they hit me on 5s. Yep. And I'm like, okay, but they're a bunch of POW 10s. Well, they're not. They're POW 11. They're base POW 11, and with the Reckoning Arcana, they go to POW 13. So dice minus 3. Dice minus 3. That's now an estimated 4 damage apiece times 10 guys is 40 damage. Kanker, I'm sure, doesn't have 40 boxes. He has half that. So we kind of just go all in. Entire unit aims. Entire unit starts shooting at Cankerworm. Succeeds shooting at Cankerworm. And v- does just tons of damage. Uh, keep going. Keep shooting. Go, you actually, go, go. you roll a little bit high, but as we just established, doing some pretty simple math, like, you definitely kill Cankerworm. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so here's where I originally think I'm going to switch it to this unit of Banes, shoot the entire unit off with Holloman, and then maybe also get to arc a spell to kill the Bannerman and someone else so you don't get any recursion. But you point out that I have three models left in the Holloman unit, and I might as well just try to kill that Death Ripper. So we do try. We, we shift it back to the Death Ripper after some thought, and we take some shots. Uh, that was boxcars for damage. Really hurts it. That's an 11 for damage. You did roll a 3 for damage on the first one, so you're below average, above, above, but you, you straight up kill the Death Reaper because it's, with the Reckoning Arcana, it's dice minus 1. Yep. Which is crazy. So I just lost half my battle group. And that to... was one unit of Holloman. Yep. So now you move the Trump Arcana over to Tartarus, who has stealth, but mm-hmm. they have Isla Sight, so you're just going to ignore that stealth as well. And you choose to aim a couple guys. Yeah. And you move a couple other guys forward. I think there's one guy off camera aiming here. Yep. Just outside the shot. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we start by shooting up Tartarus. The um the lantern men save for a better job to do because they can only lure living models. They just put up that concealment effect, which yep. is pretty powerful still. Uh you're just going to take a couple shots at Tartarus. So uh, Tartarus is defense 12. 12. Armor 17. So fives to hit and dice off four. Yep. And I think it takes three guys to shoot It does. Down. It takes three guys to kill Tartarus. And then you cycle that Trump Arcana over to the unit of Banes here. Mm-hmm. And you've got some good attacks it on this unit of Banes. Yeah. Like, first of all, you've got seven members left in that Holloman unit who've got some good shots. Yeah, and I'm also making sure that I'm not taking away targets from the Dreadrots because I want to make sure they can get some corpses for my other models in the army, such as the Cage Rager and the Skin Moans. And one of the other things that's really interesting about the, the Bagman rule is they deny tough. Um, like, right now I'm making a bunch of tough checks and I'm, I'm not passing tough checks, but, like, the Hollow Men are shooting me and I'm like, okay, that guy's going to be knocked down and they've got Rise and they can stand up for free. But your rule 
on the um, the uh, dread rots that removes me from play, which is also relevant against Asphyxius. Um, it denies tough on those models. So uh, as soon as they go in, they're going to deal with models who are not tough. Yeah, Grimkin is an army with a surprising number of RFP effects because basically all their heavies, RFP living in undead on Kel. Yep. Because they both have Bone Picker. And doesn't the Death Knell do something as well? Uh, it has Entropic Force, which denies tough and right. removing damage. That's what it is. But uh, you've got RFP on the Bagmen's melee attacks. Yep. Um, you've got a couple of other sources of RFP out there. Like I think it's I think you've got the tools. Uh, so there's a proxy base for where the skin and moans is going to end up because I want to RFB more banes. Yep, seems put super it, <laughs> to put it simply. Uh, so he lurkers himself and charges. Uh, he is also targeting the, the air quotes prey unit. Uh, so yep. he's Matt nine. nine. Power strength arbitrarily uh, high. Yeah, <laughs> power strength high enough that it kills them automatically. Um. Yeah, you stick your second initial into one of these guys. He toughs, but I just, you just buy, buy an, an attack. attack and finish him off. Yeah. And last attack on another guy. He does not tough. So you've collected all the corpses. So Skin of Moans is full on corpses, full on fury. Uh, however, I mean, he's really, really high armor now. Yep. He's the 1319 monster that a lot of players are kind of afraid of in Grimkin right now. Yeah, and I mean, if he gets that Death Knell aura, he'll be even higher. Um, the Dread Rot over here, they're charging. Uh, a couple of them are charging into this unit of Bane uh, th Knights Warriors, and the rest are charging the Knights in the middle. Yep. And they run it up to make a little bit of a screen. Mm -hmm. Basically, make a big old hole for the Death Knell to stand in after they get corpses that they can give to the Death Knell. So this guy decent. gets a corpse because he killed a warrior and then we have a couple attacks uh set defense doesn't matter when you roll box cars and then kill because you're four dice power 10 it's pretty good uh other guy misses so we got two corpses on dread rots right now yep cage is gonna walk up or run rather uh take a corpse off of a dread rot so now he's an arc note and the plan here is the heretic's gonna go He's going to arc gallows after, sorry, the death now will move up and get a corpse first. Warmth of the Grave is now active. Um, yeah, big the deal. The heretic is planning on arcing a gallows at the banner, pulling it so that it's out of take-up range and then killing it, so removing a lot of uh, recursion once that happens. Uh, the cage ridger up top is also looking to just go and smack a bane, basically become an arc node on the other side of the table as well as contest this zone because uh, don't want Asphyxius getting points for free. Yep. Yeah, you gotta, gotta stay relevant. I feel like Recon 2, the scenario we're playing right now, is actually one of the more live scenarios in 2017. Yes. I think uh, I think it's super live. I also like think it's one of the best scenarios they've made in a while. Hmm. I, really, I really like how um, it gives you really hard choices with how the flags are placed. Yeah. Um, it gives you an objective that you have to go super deep for and maybe give something up a lot of the time to get, but it's it's very valuable because of how many s points you can score in a single turn in this scenario. It really asks your casters to move up where they can score both the flags and the zones at the same time. Yep. Um, puts them in those kind of somewhat dangerous dominate situations we saw a lot in 2016. Yep. Um, and even though it ha it's uh, a scenario with two rectangle zones, it still very much values uh, infantry-heavy lists because they can still contest those very active scenario pieces. Yeah, so, that's probably true. Yeah, like these zones are incredibly active basically all the time, and... You can just continually contest with infantry models if you have a lot of them, so you're not necessarily losing out if you only have infantry. Sorry, I mean, I just want to catch our viewers up a little bit. You um, uh, you moved in with that Cage Rager, it became an Arc Node, and then you did your 
cool gallows play to kill the banner in the bottom portion of the board, and then you also rebuked the banes in the top portion of the board. Correct. So yeah, that that that's a really relevant piece of the heretics kit is rebuke. Um, yeah. It scares scares players who want to charge to do work. Yeah. And in combination with pandemonium as one of my arcana, it de- denies a huge number of orders on the table. Yeah, and then just you know, in a little attempt to be a bit dickish, I think you just charged that um, uh, gorehound in. Yep, I charged a super knights. deep with the gorehound. You just walked in to avoid the set defense, something, something like something. that. Something. And then you you just lightning strike moved in, and you're like, "Hey, Asphyxius, I'm right here now." Yep, it's like, "Hey, you have to deal with this," because um, he's ghostly, so he doesn't care about any of the free strikes that you might make yep. or not. Um, and he has extended control range, so he can just be that far up the table, and I won't have to care about it. So Asphyxius is on nine, and I've got some decisions to make. There's a lot of dudes in front of me, but I did collect a couple souls last turn, so I got the soul train rolling a little bit. Um, Scorehound's a problem, because it threatens the sort of relative safety that I felt I had here. So step one is figure out figure out what needs to happen to remove the Gorehound. And step two is figure out where Asphyxius is going to leverage his spell-slinging might. I also feel like it's worth noting that the heretic is currently on zero. That one token next to him is actually a corpse on the death knell. When we say he's on zero, we mean he's a 15-17 caster who cannot be targeted by spells. Or Correct. knocked down or made blind. Correct. So he's just fine. So, Wraith Engine moves over. Uh, attacks the Gorehound. Charge attack does a bunch of damage. Sorry, charge attack missed. Second attack did a bunch of damage. Third attack did a bunch of damage. Yeah, Gorehound only has 20 boxes, so he gets two shot from the Wraith Engine because the Wraith Engine is POW 15 with Dark Shroud. Yep. Uh, the Gorehound, I believe, is armor... 13, four, maybe? 13 maybe or 12? 14? It's, yeah. Not a whole lot. He's, he's got defense 14, but the Wraith Engine's Mat 7, so, you know, it... Arm it, 13, so it's... It hit 2 out of 3. It's dice plus 6. Or 4. Plus 4. Plus Math. Four. I yep. applied Dark Shred twice. Yep. My bad. Um, so now it's Asphyxius time. Um, Asphyxius is just going to sort of see how many guys are in that little cluster over there, where they seem pretty tightly packed up. Yeah, so uh, Asphyxius has a spell that I didn't know he had. You're not the only one who brought a death knell. Yep. Ao. Yep. Yeah. So Death Knell is kind of a clutch spell that I don't get a ton of work out of with Asphyxius. Um, but when it comes up, it can be just amazing. Uh, occasionally I've feeded to drop a bunch of models around something and then put Death Knell on top of them. Um, but other times models are just really nicely clustered up. So Asphyxius moves. Uh, he ran an Arc Nerd into position already, and I cast Death Knell after dropping Dame Mortis's Cloud. Now, you notice I already have a soul. That's from when the Gorehound died. He was within Asphyxius's soul collection range, which is two inches. So I collected mm-hmm. that soul. Then I moved over here, dropped down my Swirling Sword of soul collection, and the Death Knell spell killed everything. Yep. Everything it touched. There all, were six models into that AoE. All of the... All of the uh, hollow men died. And they aren't undead, so they have souls. Yep. And now Asphyxius has seven of them. Mm Mm-hmm. Seven souls. Like, as if they weren't having a bad enough time being turned into, like, hollow people from deserting the army. Now they just are souls trapped in a terrifying Lich Lord's grasp. What what a terrible way to die. They've had... (laughs) I think it's fair to say they've had a bad time. Yeah, they've had a real bad time. Like, God, dude. So, uh, speaking of God, dude, that is Asphyxius' main ambition, is to just become a god. Eh. So, you know. That's like half the characters in this game's ambition. It's like it's like two of them. It's Barnabas, and his worked. And his Asphyxius, worked. his did not. Eh, fair enough. I'm so, excited for Barney too. That's uh, a different discussion for a different day. That's a different day. discussion. But it does seem really <laughs> cool. The little bone shakers in his unit. They're pretty awesome. Uh, so this unit who got rebuke on them, they just moved in. Uh, they walked into melee range of a bunch of hollow men and they just started swinging. Uh, they need sixes to hit, but hell if that doesn't work some of the time. Um, I'm getting, you know, three dice a couple of times. Uh, I ended up getting four on the Cage Rager and they did like some pretty solid work. But he has armor 19, and even with Dark Shroud, that drops down to 17. I'm still dice minus 6. So without being able to charge, there was very little chance I was going to do it. 
ton of work. Um, the Banes killed a guy who was in the um, the aura. Uh, so Asphyxia's collected another soul. And then the Bane Knights are going to charge. Uh, they're going to try to do some work against Dread Rots. One of them is going to charge the Cage Rager. Here's another one in on the Cage Rager. And they're just getting that Wall of Steel bonus. UA is kind of moving into Jam a little bit. I'm trying to see how much work I can do against the Cage Rager. He's, um, he's got good base stats. But um, with the bonus from the Dark Shroud already being in place. And with their Brutal Charge bonus... Uh, knights are basically power strength 16, so they're only dice minus 3 against the Cage Rager. Because they're, they're base 12, 14 with Brutal Charge, and then 2 more from Dark Shroud. So they end up um, they end up doing a little bit of damage to him. And the spike's pretty nicely there on the last one. Kills the Cage Rager. Clears the zone. There's one one guy with the, uh, the lantern still left in the unit. He was not in range of any of the Banes to kill, so he got to live. Yeah, well... Live is a relative term, I, I suppose. Say it was a great life. I said he's alive, <laughs> having left his people and sought the comfort of some hollow men. They're not that comfortable, but they are fairly hollow. Kind of a Swiss cheese thing going on. <laughs> what been, does that even mean? Like, there's holes in them. That's what I, I'm not saying that they taste like Emmental. I'm saying that they, you know, they're all right, whatever. A little holier than thou. It was Derek Wraith getting a free battle wizard off of a knockdown Dreadrot. Yep, I knocked down the Dreadrot. And you're like, I have Rise. I'll stand up in my turn. I was like, no, you won't. Scythe to face. And then he's like, I cast Mortal Fear. I don't like that. I don't it's, like uh, that. It's pretty, it's pretty decent. It's, uh, it's a really good ability. Uh, gives enemy models within his command of nine inches minus two to damage rolls. Living models. Though. Living models. I'm so sorry. In your Horde's army, that will be everything. Man. <laughs> Why you gotta be like that? It's uh, it's a respect issue. Okay. All I heard is blah blah blah. I you know, I you. could just play Zal too. That's that's absolutely fair. That is a possible option here. You would have nothing for me to make mortally afraid. Uh, I do run the Scarlock at this point. The Scarlock is now on the far flag, and that uh, Lantern Man is just out of contesting range. So I'm prepared to get two points in that zone. Mm-hmm. Even though you killed all of my jacks. Mm-hmm. Well, there's still a Death Ripper up there. There is. And then there's a, a Death Ripper in this zone at the bottom. Mm -hmm. They will have less success, though. We hope. I considered having Asphyxius go for like a Parasite play on the side of the board, but then I remembered the Arcane Vortex that the Cage Rager has. So it's actually probably the fact that that Arcane Vortex is available that prevents um, uh, me from having killed the Skin and Bones this turn. Yeah. It's a big deal. Because as much as the two Banes can char charge and hit, um, I'm armed 21. Dark Shroud makes me arm 19. Uh, dice minus 6. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's a big deal. No, dice minus 8. Because you're 21? Yeah. Because you're in the Death Nails range? Correct. Cool. Yeah, I wasn't sure if you were in that range, but I'm pretty sure you are now. So end of the turn, Tim scores two. Two-point lead. Step one, pressure that scenario. So huge swings in this game. Like, I had a, a really strong turn here where I managed to get a lot of work out of mostly Asphyxius, if, if we're being honest about it. It's, it's just Lich who's done all the work in this matchup. Um, but that followed, like, heavy on the heels of you just blowing up so much of my army with your Trump Arcana. Yeah. Uh, and I, I upkeep rebuke because I think it's important to have that top unit of Banes doing as little as possible. Yeah, you can ignore them pretty readily with rebuke. That's Especially deal. just because they've done their job on the top side of the table. I don't want them doing some form of sweeping flank into the grabbing the bottom zone. Yeah, and, and like they want to just run every turn or charge something, and they their speed is cut effectively in half by denying them that. Yeah. It's... it's it's really good. It's really good. Uh, so, I also didn't use any of my Arcana that turn. Yeah, I was a little bit surprised about that. Um, you had you had a couple of options. Times that I thought maybe it would have made sense would be the charging of the Bane Knights. You could have uh, Labyrinth that. I'm not sure if the Officer 
was in range. That that's the mm-hmm. question. Is it always has to be the leader model for that arcana? Yeah. And the other one was labyrinth. Um, but you're you're playing a fairly conservative heretic game. Like you're keeping him pretty far back. Mm-hmm. And I think that that limits what you can do with your arcana. Yeah. I think defilers really do need to play fairly far up the table. So, basically, um, defiers. Defiers. What did I say? What did I say? Defilers. That's a different thing, isn't it? That's a different thing. Fair enough. So, um, moving swiftly forward from that. My, I feel like I was trying to be very uh, careful and aware of Asphyxius' feet because of the terror was last edition and how many times I died to it. Um, that said, Labyrinth is a pretty great counter to that feat because you charge in with the first solo and I say that the rest have minus two speed and are maybe out of threat now. Yeah. Um, so I was kind of keeping that one in my back pocket just in case I got a little too close to you and you managed to pull that feat off it's really the only avenue to assassination i have given that you can't be targeted by spells mm-hmm. so it's it's a smart one to hang hang on to uh you've also taken away my map fixer in tartarus because he was a veteran leader for banes yes so i have to roll nines on the heretic uh so this is holloman standing and aiming uh and shooting engaged banes and uh two of them in the back arc just hit and made you for uh, do tough checks and that one failed and then I shot him because he was on the ground so we've cleared out the Skinner moans more or less there's one more Bane in, er, sorry that's the Death Ripper engaging him and this unit of Hollow Man has basically cleared out the entire unit of Banes yep because they can yeah, I did not adequately respect Holloman during the CID process. They are really mopey in every single stat until you realize that one, they just get there and two, they don't need to be particularly well defended when you're playing Grimkin because a lot of your army is made up out of fairly soft targets that reprisal very, very well. Mm-hmm. And being kind of a soft target is a great way to proc Reckoning. It's a great way to you know have some of those other uh, arcana on board when you need them. So, uh, update. Cage, Raider, Cage Rager beat Death Ripper to death. Yep. Skin and Moans now planning on charging into the objective, hopefully getting... Dara Graith, somewhere in that mix. Uh, my original plan was hope to have enough distance to get to the Wraith engine and kill the Wraith engine. Right. And maybe the objective. Uh, don't quite have the distance, unfortunately. But we can get to the objective, so that's good. Uh, Lantern Man that's left over from the top unit runs into the zone, contests the flag and the zone. He is there to deny two points from Tim this turn. That's a pretty good job for him. It is, because I, I now have to figure out a way of getting the rest of my list or just anything that can contest up into that zone. The Skin and Moans is making a, a rush for it right now by getting to the objective, killing the objective, and continuing to move up. Um, but I don't feel like that's going to be enough, considering the fact that a unit of Banes is about to get in the way of him getting in the zone. Yeah, it's, it's a really interesting version of Recon 2 that we seem to be playing here, because often this game becomes, I'm going to take my zone and you can have your zone, with those zones being defined by the relationship to where the flag is placed. But in this, in this version of, uh, of Recon, we've just done the opposite of that. Like, I've aggressively positioned to take Evan's zone, and he has almost trivially removed all of the pieces from, air quotes, my zone. Yeah. So we've done a really interesting swing in this game. That said, I have, I'm in a lot worse of a position to capture your flag because you killed my only solo. That's correct. Yes. You killed my Witchwood. Uh, it'd probably be a great idea for me to kill your Scarlock Thrall. I just don't really have anything that can get there in, right now. Yeah, it's a bit of a puzzle. Um the placement of those Bane Knights is really screening off like the death knell from doing something cute, like charging into it. Mm. Uh, you can go through your own objective, but you can't go through a bunch of Bane Knights. It's true. Uh, and the Skin of Moans just is beating on the objective right now, taking a couple swings at Derek Wraith in the meantime. The way that you charge means you, you had to do your damage against the objective first, so you were affected by mortal fear for it. Mm-hmm. And you do dismount Derag, but on your last attack. Yes. Because, again, mortal fear keeps him alive way more than you'd expect it to. It's true. So, end of my turn, I score two from killing the objective and controlling the bottom zone. Yep. Very nice. And Tim does none. not score because of that lovely little lantern man left over from his hollow man unit. That lantern man. Now he's a lonely man. I have 14 focus this turn. 
Yep. <laughs> <laughs> 14 um, focus is pretty cool. Not going to lie. Not a lot of casters in the game can boast that. Um, what am I going to do with it? Uh, spend it frivolously. Uh, it's a giant pile of focus. What do you think? Um, I've got some options here, uh, and some of them are weirder than others. Uh, for one, the Scarlock Thrall is going to go up first, and he is going to base the flag and attempt to excarnate the Lantern Man. Lantern Man has no melee weapons, so the Scarlock just walked into his back. It's true. It's true. And he's going to cast excarnate, because... Why wouldn't I? He'll hit with a 10. Nice roll in Scarlock. And POW 13 kills him. And yep. the Scarlock will have the option of adding an undead model to a unit in within three inches of him. It's just going to just gonna put one of the Bane friends down. Yep. That seems reasonable. That guy has to forfeit his combat action, but that's okay. Yeah. They weren't go going very far anyway this turn because they're still rebuked. Just, just numbers. Just get a bunch of them down. Uh, I'm aware that this skin and bones here is a bit of a problem that I have to address in one way or another. Um, I'm also looking at what I'm going to do with the Wraith engine, where it can charge to, where it can end up being at the end of that charge. Uh, it's probably going to uh, avoid the attacking the skin and bones directly and try to just contest the zone, threaten pieces, maybe kill some stuff, maybe make a machine wraith. Uh, it charges the Dread Rot, uh, gets to hit the Dread Rot, forces Evan to make a tough check, which he fails. Which creates a Machine Wraith. It does create a Machine Wraith. So now I've got a Machine Wraith to go do work somewhere else. Um, also removed from play effect, so that's useful. Yep. Denies. We're looking for a Machine Wraith right now. Yep. No, it <laughs> took a moment here. Uh, pay his boys and girls to have your... Uh, toys with you when you're ready to play yeah uh, yeah my machine wraith is in the next room um yeah it uh this is a really interesting night when we recorded this we also had um someone sent from the game store to the hospital which doesn't happen very often yeah no that was a thing uh moving swiftly forward from that <laughs> yeah no it, it was it was just a weird night it was just uh. kind of a little jinx not like caliban level jinx but like yeah yeah no not that it's hard to get that level jinx. It is. It is. So not um, to belittle someone going to the hospital, I feel like we should point that out. <laughs> yeah, I know for sure. I mean, <laughs> like we we can kind of talk about it or joke about it now because he was actually totally okay. Um, everything worked out fine, um, but he did hit his head in one of the bathrooms. So we we just wanted to be kind of you know yeah aware of that. I pandemoniumed that unit of Bane's, so they failed their order and just walked and stabbed things instead of charging. Big deal this round. I think Evan may have actually made a smart choice to save the pandemonium, um, which it, I, I kind of I often think like, shouldn't you prop an arcana every turn? And Evan's counter argument was um, it, like, you, you kind of have to pick the moments in the game you're going to use them. And for him, his moments were pandemonium to prevent this unit from costing him anything, which it really does. Uh, I don't kill the objective. I don't do meaningful damage to the death knell. Uh, I kill exactly one dread rot who has rise in the theme force, so he's just going to stand up for free. Yep. So because he toughed, I basically do nothing with that unit of knights this turn. Yeah. To go on back to that arcana point, uh, actually, you know what? Talk about machine gun asphyxias first. I. <laughs> <laughs> so asphyxias is like, well, that's not okay. So he throws parasite out on the objective, puts parasite on the objective. It is friendly faction, so it benefits from the um, death now to the grave aura. Uh, so its armor of 20 goes down to 17. Um, I excarnate it. <laughs> so, uh, not going to lie, thought you were going to death knell it using your own models as damage point buffs to the objective? I mean, yes, that would have been effective at killing the objective. It definitely would have killed all of my own models. Fair enough. So I opted not to do that. Instead, I spent most of my stack just blowing it to bits. And I leave it on, I think, one box with a bunch of boosted excarnates. And you feet. And a feet. And I bring back a whole bunch of Banes. And I'm like, these Banes are going to be the Banes that kill the skin and bones. So Asphyxias can leave that problem over there and just teleport back to the edge of the zone and be camping one. Uh, yep. So going back to what I was going to say about Arcanas, as the Banes murder both the objective and the skin and bones, they feel a lot like... Um, 
most defensive feats in that they get more effective as the game goes on. Because mm. you think you want to use a defensive feat to protect as much of your army as possible. Which is true. That's, generally speaking, the most effective way of using them. Uh, except, thinking about it, you play a game against Fianna, and she doesn't feed the turn you think she's going to feed. And you just go on, kill a couple, couple of her pieces, she kills a lot of yours as well. And suddenly you have less resources to deal with the thing she has feeded on, even though it's fewer pieces. You mm. don't have the resources to deal with that feat anymore. Right. And suddenly... Like you're in a you're in hot water, like it's just impossible to deal with three nerfs or two nerfs that are plus three defense because you no longer have the tools to kill those models. So it's kind of like that in that you save your most effective arcana for later on in the game because they matter a hell of a lot more when you have two models as opposed to when you have fifteen. Right. Okay. That's that's a good perspective. I kind of like that. Um, just to, to review the top of the turn here, uh, Scarlock scored in the zone as did Asphyxius and or the Jack pick, pick one. Um, I denied Evan scoring in the bottom zone with the movement of that Wraith engine. And what we've got here is Crix on four, Grimkin on two. Yep. So oh, sorry. you also got one for the objective. For the so objective. On so five. 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 Five to two. So three point CP lead for Crix. And it's a little bit tricky to contest that top zone right now. Yeah. So effectively what I have to do is figure out a way to both kill the Wraith Engine without using too many pieces, get into the top zone, and uh, maybe somehow, if possible, score on uh, the bottom flag. Something along those lines is the plan. Uh, it's going to be really hard. The fact that you've just completely jammed the death knell out of the top zone is really hurting right now because he was basically the only hope of something to get into that zone, and now I have to just find a way to get through that. Like, maybe had you cast death knell and I could steal it, yep, I'd be able to get through this a lot easier. Or if you were cl a little closer to me and I could steal your arc, Excarnate even. Yep. I'd have some better tools to deal with this. But right now it's a little hard. Do you feel like you've played the Heretic a little bit too conservatively this game? A little bit, yeah. I feel like had I been closer up the last turn maybe I could have... Uh, sorry, two turns ago when uh, I didn't use an Arcana. Perhaps if I had been a little closer up and used an Arcana like Labyrinth um, mm -hmm. I would be in a better position just because I would have had more room for the Dreadrots, more room for the Death Knell, something like that. Um, or even I could have just been getting more work done with the uh, Heretic himself had I been far enough up to steal Death Knell the one turn it annihilated a unit of Holloman. Right. Because I could have just done the same thing right back to your Banes. But I've gotten myself into a bit of a, a problem here because I've kind of s gotten stuck behind the Death Knell. And I can't really... Move the death knell lest I take many free strikes. So right now, dread rots are going in such a way that they are just killing Banes, uh, being as effective as they possibly can. A uh, bunch of them got corpses. They're not really going to be a too effective. Uh, Heretic charging on the machine wraith because he's basically the only thing that can kill it, and he's in the zone now, so he's scoring. Um, not that the cage rager wasn't already. Uh, he also casts fury on a unit of Holloman. Okay. Yeah. Through the Cage Rager as a channeler? Or Yeah. Oh no, just just yourself. He, he, just yourself. He's, he's barely got one in his. Yeah, we, we talked about this during arc. the match you, you turn and get him in melee because the Cage Rager is engaged as a channeler. Yeah. But uh, you also just walked over the wall. Basically. Um, because you auto hit and you have pow that exceeds armor, so you don't actually need the charge bonus. It's true. Uh so Furied Holloman are kind of spooky. So they are kind of like trenchers. They have... I get it. Spooky. Yeah. So they've got a one-inch melee. They've got a one-inch melee. And they have brutal charge. They have br bayonet charge. I think it's brutal charge, isn't it? Sorry. Yeah, it is brutal charge. They're the same thing. Okay. Um, they have brutal charge, so they go to power 11. Yep. Power 14 with uh, Fury. Not bad. Pretty That's respectable. It's bayonet level stats. Just imagine if Reckoning had been up this turn. No. <laughs> so they're they're hitting pretty hard. Um, 
I got a ton of charges on the Wraith engine, which helps as well. Yeah, I mean, it does have that that low, um, like that that very possible chance that you miss because the ones that have back racks needed five to hit, but the other guys need sevens to hit. Yes, defense twelve ain't nothing. Mm-hmm. But uh, yeah, you're uh, you're looking for a victor. I'm to trying to see if Derek the uh, cage Redder can possibly trample over the hollow men in front of him and boost to kill Derek. He can't, so I'm just going to run in such a way that he's there. Um, yeah, it's it's rough. Uh, I believe uh, at this point I go with the death knell and kill a dude. You're and like, then horse kick. Uh, yep, horse kick, hit with the death knell itself because he has a weapon called death knell. Yep, that's the, the stick. Um, it's like a like a, a bell. A literal knell. Yep. Like okay. The sounding of a bell. Uh, and I end my turn because I can't get to Tim's zone. Uh, sc- so you score two more, and then you end your turn immediately and get ahead of me by five. Yep. That is how that shook out. Yeah. I just couldn't get into your zone to contest, so that's how the game ended. Yeah. I mean, sometimes that's that's how the game ends. Um, I think the heretic's a super neat caster, super deep, lots of yes. really cool tools there. Um, I also think that Asphyxius has gotten a lot of his, uh, his groove back yeah, as they say. A lot of his toys with dark host. Yes, absolutely. Dark host is a huge theme for him. Uh, it's really just this reminder that what privateer press is doing with themes is deepening the access you have to the tools in your faction by restricting them in certain places. So it's a really clever evolution of the concept of design space, and we could probably talk about that at some length. (laughs) Um, But yeah, let us know what you think of the video. Uh, If you have not already, please subscribe to our channel on the YouTubes. Um, Check us out on Facebook. We're in a lot of the groups and stuff and happy to engage in a conversation. If you have things you want to ask about Grimkin or Dark Host, uh, leave a comment and we'll reply. We do our best to reply to every comment. Yep. And stay tuned this week for more Guild Ball. Yeah. As well as next Monday is most likely going to be the Dreamer. Yeah. Uh, I'll probably be piloting that list. So if you've been looking forward to seeing the Dreamer, tune in next Monday. I'm so scared. It's going to be so amazing. Uh, uh, yep. Okay. That's 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 it, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye.